I was just walking along the woods today and I found some chanterelle mushrooms. What we commonly refer to as chanterelle mushrooms are actually golden chanterelles. But golden chanterelles are probably the most sought after and one of the most delicious types of edible mushrooms. You gotta be careful because if you eat the wrong kind of mushroom, you can get very sick or even die. So there's a few key identification points. First of all, the golden color. Second of all, look at the gills. Chanterelles have something called false gills and they fork. Whereas another mushroom, see how that's a much deeper gill than the false gills of the chanterelle. And third of all is the stem. It's a dense stem and when you pull it and separate it, it kind of pulls apart like a cheese string. A different mushroom, see how it just kind of breaks apart and the stem is pretty much hollow. So if it's got forking false gills, of course the golden orangey color, and the stalk peels like a cheese string and is not hollow, you got yourself a delicious edible chanterelle mushroom. Salt, butter or margarine, garlic powder and onion powder sauteed in a pan. Chanterelles are amazing. I'm going to show you my favorite way to fry up beer battered walleye over the fire. So first thing you're going to want to do is get your fire going. If you don't have a grill, you're going to have to move rocks around until they're in the right position to support your pan. Then you're gonna to wanna to fillet your fish and take the skin right off. We want skinless fillets here. Beer butter mix is basically just flour. You can buy it pre-mixed, you can do it at home. Add maybe a little corn flour, some salt and pepper. I'm just gonna use water. Beer's great, but you might wanna drink your beer. That's about the right consistency for me. The thicker your liquid batter is, the thicker your battering on your fish will be. Put some oil in your pan and you're gonna let that heat over the fire till it's nice and sizzling hot. A good way to tell if your oil's hot enough is just by flicking a little water on it. See how the water bubbles? That means it's good. Dip the fillets into the beer batter mixture, lay them into that hot oil. You can control the heat of your fire by pulling logs in and out of it. Flip them once and just cook till they're golden brown and delicious. A little tartar sauce, baby. Mmm, that was delicious. Today I'm going to show you how to preserve berries using fire. I'm at a backcountry campsite and I saw some very juicy, very ripe raspberries. So first thing I did, I lit a fire. I want this fire to radiate, throw off some really good heat. So I threw a fair amount of wood on there. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to look for a smooth, flat rock. A good place to find exposed rocks is often along the shore. And uh, what's good about that too is they'll probably be pretty clean. That looks like a pretty decent sized rock. To preserve these berries, what I'm gonna do is crush them up and I'm gonna kinda spread them all over that flat rock, just like I'd spread jam. And I'm gonna build a little rack which I'm gonna be able to prop that rock up on. And I'm gonna hold that rack near the fire, not too close so that it burns, but far enough away so that it slowly dries. And I'm gonna know when it's done because those raspberries will flake off the rock almost like chips and will last a very long period of time. Pretty good. So there you go, that's how you preserve berries with fire. So we are making some bannock here. First of all, I bring pre-mixed bannock powder. Flour, baking powder, and salt. I also put some powdered milk in, not a necessity, but uh, gives a nice flavor. And we're going to mix in some butter, and we're gonna mix that into a dough with some water, and uh, then we're gonna fry it up on low. It's better to actually stir bannock than to, to knead it. You knead it a minimal amount, it will rise higher and be lighter and fluffier on the inside. I'm gonna throw that on, I'm just gonna use some oil. It's gonna form a nice big piece. Pretty thin too. Size it out to the shape of the pan. I'm gonna turn that right down. Use, some, use a cover. That kind of makes it like a Dutch oven. That'll make it rise a little bit faster. And I'm gonna leave this for about 10 minutes and I'm gonna come back and check on it. Wow, look at how much that's risen. That's what you want right there. If it doesn't cook in the middle and it's too greasy and too doughy, it can give you an upset stomach. Cooking on low for another 10 minutes roughly. And I think it's about done. Oh yeah. Want it to be nice and fluffy. 
just here in the bush today and I am going to smoke some venison in a teepee over the fire. I got the fire going here already. I'm gonna let that burn down a little bit. I'm using standing dead dry maple and one of the misconceptions is that you really need wet damp wood to smoke venison but you really don't and now I'm gonna set up my smoker. I got my three pieces that I'm gonna make the tripod with and I'm gonna lash them all together. Set up the tripod over the fire. I'm gonna build a rack out of sticks. Okay, so the teepee set up. Our next step is to get our venison and thinly slice it. The fillet knife is an awesome tool for this job. Good idea to cut as much fat off as you can. So I'm gonna cut down almost right through it, keeping a thin piece along the bottom, right to the edge, and flip it over like a book. And I'm gonna do the same thing here again. I'm gonna flip that over, and I'm gonna go back the other way, flip it open. That's looking like a separate piece. Flip that over again there. There you have another piece. Long and thin is what you want. If there's any thicker pieces, don't be scared to go in and slice little slices in those thicker parts of it. I'm gonna throw my venison strips over top of the rack. I'm gonna wrap the whole thing in a tarp and I'm just gonna let this smokehouse smoke all night long. I'll feed it a couple times during the night. Tomorrow we're gonna have some smoked venison and it is gonna be delicious. Okay, so it's the next day. I let the smoker run throughout the night. You can see the lighter colored part that was sitting on top of the rack. It's not getting the heat and smoke, so it's not gonna dry. So I'm gonna flip those pieces of meat and just slide them to one side a little bit to make sure that part gets dried out. So it's coming along really well, but it's gonna take a while longer. Okay, so the venison has been smoking for 15 or 16 hours. So I'm gonna check it out now. I think it's pretty much ready to take off the rack. See how it almost, it cracks like that. And when you look at it, it's completely dry throughout. Mmm, that is delish. There is our big, delicious pieces. And that's how you smoke meat when you're in the bush. I have a trout to cook, and I'm gonna do it on a stick over the fire. And this will give you um, almost a little bit of a dry, smoky flavor. It's very tasty, primitive way to cook a trout. First thing you wanna do is get a fire going, let it burn a little while, get some coals in there. And then you want to go select a Y stick, and I found one that'll do. We're going to sharpen these two ends, and then we're going to stab those sharpened pieces in behind the front bottom fins of the trout. That its tail is going to lie on top of here, and we're just going to suspend that right over the fire. It's important to make sure the whole trout is suspended over the fire. You don't want the tail outside of the fire ring. So I've used two rocks to support the stick. I'm going to just keep my eye on the fire, and about 15, 20 minutes, we'll have a delicious cooked trout. As opposed to it being squishy and kind of bouncing, like rubbery, when you squeeze the whole thing and you can feel it kind of crush under your hands, that's when you know it's cooked. Look at the inside, all perfectly cooked. Love it. So one of the most important survival items or tools to bring with you when you go in the bush is some cordage, anything from rigging up tarp to shelter building to making a bow drill fire. So today I'm gonna show you how to make emergency cordage out of a tarp. So first I'm gonna take three strands of this tarp, both the same width and length. The thicker the strands you make, the thicker your rope is gonna be. About two and a half, three inches thick. I just take the bottom one, I twist it in a counterclockwise direction, so towards me, and then I fold it away from me over top of both of them. Twist it towards me, fold it away. This is actually gonna give you more strength in the rope than a braid. You just keep doing like that, twisting towards yourself, folding it away from yourself, and within a half an hour, an hour, you're gonna have a really strong rope. Get a nice overhand knot there to finish that off. I took a seat on some rocks and I spent a little bit of time and within about a half an hour, I was able to wind this entire piece of cordage and it's actually very strong. You can really tug on that. So there we go, pretty key survival skill is knowing how to make emergency cordage. Particularly for live catching game birds like grouse or ptarmigan. First you're gonna need a stake sharpened at one end with a groove, a stick about a foot long, a notched toggle, some bait, two forked sticks sharpened at one end, a net, some cordage, a multi-tool axe, and you're gonna need a trigger board here. I don't have a sapling right where I want one right now. I'm gonna improvise and I'm gonna use a branch from a tree and I'm gonna tie it to the base of a tree and that bent branch is what's gonna cause the springing action. 
I want to set my trap directly underneath where my cord comes down when it's under tension. I'm gonna punch these two fork sticks into the ground. This little kind of crossbar piece is gonna go under there. This stake at the back of your trigger board with this facing forward. And that looks like the spot and I'm going to tie my toggle on right there. Make sure that's super tight. I have a piece of cordage threaded around the top of my net. Lay that net down on top of my trigger board. Tie another length of parachute cord to the opposite side. Two pieces of parachute cord. Bring the toggle down, step on. And I'm going to tie them to the same line that the toggle is tied to. The toggle is going to go on one side of this kind of crossbar piece and it's gonna wedge against the trigger board and there our trap's set. It is illegal to trap birds, so this is something that you're gonna to wanna to use in a survival situation only. And that is how you set a springing net trap. Just dumped rain last night and I'm gonna to try to get a bow drill fire going. Now it's a lot harder when things are damp. So there's a trick that you whittle your fireboard and your spindle out of the center of a standing dead cedar tree. And it looks like it is nice and dry. To make a bow drill fire, you need a bow and some sort of cordage. You need a fireboard, a spindle, and a palm piece. So I have my standing dead piece of cedar and I'm gonna cut my fireboard out of this. Try to make a half inch thick board. It's looking pretty good. Now I'm gonna make my spindle and I'm just splitting this into a square. It's gonna round it out. Okay, there we go. And for my top piece, I'm going to use a piece of hardwood that's a little damp. Whittle a little indentation in the middle of this palm piece. Now I'm gonna make a little notch right in my board. That's gonna go like that. Now I need to find my bow has a natural curve. I'm just gonna carve this down. I'm just going to tie my parachute cord to my bow. I'm gonna put my spindle in the bowstring as I tie it. And that I would say is just about the perfect tightness for my bowstring. And you see how loose it is when I take off the spindle. I'm just gonna take some cedar bark scrapings and collected a bunch more birch bark. I peeled the dry middle out of it so I have my tinder ball ready to go. Okay, so I have my spindle wrapped on the outside of the bow and I'm gonna put my top piece on. I'm gonna brace my arm against my leg and the hardest part is getting it going. So I'm just gonna kind of warm up a bit. The important thing with the first round is that you kind of get the shape of the spindle worn in. So we're gonna stop and I'm going to make this groove a little deeper. Okay, so we're burnt in now. Let's give this a shot. Oh yeah, that's a nice call. So there we go, bow drill fire, using the center of a standing dead tree in wet conditions. Great thing to use for lighting fires is a ferro rod. They will throw off sparks even after they've been submerged and they're soaking wet. It'll give you a lot more fire lights than a lighter will. I like to bring a really big one because it lasts longer and it's gonna throw more sparks. It can be a little more challenging than a lighter, but if you learn how to use it, it can really save your butt. Collect some shavings of cedar bark until I get like a ball of fluff and these will even work if they're a little bit damp. Now I'm gonna find a balsam fir tree and one of the ways to identify balsam firs is they have a whole bunch of little natural blisters on the trunk that are filled with sap. It's an evergreen tree, soft needles. I'm gonna pop those little blisters and I'm gonna basically soak up all that sap onto my ball of cedar fluff. And you can see how that resin just so easily takes a spark. So there is a great way to get a fire going using a ferro rod. So shoot quite a ways here in the bush, just exploring some new territory, and I am trying to make sure I hit a specific part of a river. So right now, I'm gonna show you how to take a bearing with a map and compass. Let's check it out. So I'm just behind this little lake right here. I'm trying to get to this rapid. So I'm gonna lie one side of my compass by this lake and the other at the rapid I wanna hit. Adjust the compass housing so that these little lines line up with the north-south facing grid lines on the topographic map. I have my unadjusted bearing 
bearing, check the declination, which is 11 degrees, adjust my compass accordingly, adding 11 degrees, because I'm in the east. If I was in the west, I would subtract 11 degrees, and then I'm gonna come back another half a degree to adjust between true north and grid north. So I'm gonna turn my body, and I'm gonna wait until the north arrow sits right within that little red box. That will orient myself to the bearing and to the map. Okay, and there we go. We're going straight that way. When you're in a dense bush like this, it's very hard to sight something far away and hide the compass. So what I like to do is I like to hold the compass in my hand and I'm gonna make sure that red north arrow stays in its place as I walk. Okay, and there we are. Hit the rapid just about perfectly. So that's how you take and follow a bearing with map and compass. So I'm trying to dry my boots out. Good thing to do is take the insoles out, dry them out, but whatever you do, it, it's definitely very hard to dry out near the toe of the boot. One thing I like to do is get some hot rocks. I just shove those in the fire and then I'm gonna shove those right into the toe of my boot. There we go, that should help dry out the toe because I'm on my last pair of dry socks and I don't want to soak them and deal with wet feet all day again. Hot rocks in the toes of your boot. Get some dry. Beautiful winter day here. I'm going to make camp right behind me. I'm going to set up a lean-to tarp, throw some boughs down, and I'm going to use fire to heat rocks. And I'm going to tuck those rocks into my sleeping bag at night, and that's going to keep me warm. There are my rocks. And I'm more or less just going to put these right in the fire. And I'm going to give them a good amount of time to heat up. The sleeping bag can take a lot more heat than your hand. So just because those rocks are burning your hand doesn't mean they're burning the sleeping bag. Just don't fall asleep with your foot on top of it. I'm not ready to go to bed yet, but but while we have some daylight, I'm gonna show you my routine of how I get these rocks out of the fire, making sure I'm wearing gloves and also probably using sticks. And I'm gonna lay them on top of a nice platform. My snowshoe would work. So I'm gonna let those cool for maybe another minute. That one's perfect. You want it like just so that you can't really pick it up long with your hands. Tuck that right down with my feet. And this third one here. Ah, uh, right in the small of my back. So that's how you use hot rocks to heat up your sleeping bag. So Ted and I are gonna build a tarp boat using sticks and wire, very similar to the one we built on a loan. We hiked in, this is a fishing hole that we like to fish, but it's kind of a challenge to get a boat in here. So we're like, why not just bring a tarp and build a boat? So we're gonna find the pieces of wood that we need to build this tarp boat. What you wanna look for is a naturally curved tree. Good place is usually along riverbanks where we are. So this is the piece I got. It's got this big natural curl like a Viking ship in the front. I'm just gonna cut my curved piece down to size because it's a little too big. Basically, after you find those two naturally curved trees, you're going to want to build gunnels. Ted and I are just gonna split up right now and we're gonna look for these pieces. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start assembling the gunnels. So we're gonna tie them on either end and then put a piece in the middle to stretch that shape of the boat. And then we're gonna use another piece that's longer that's gonna sit on top and that will allow us to wire it to the gunnel and hold that shape. The next step is taking those two curved pieces that we found and basically wiring the gunnels that we just built to the top of those. And then wiring those two together to create the shape of a bow and stern. And that's gonna give us our basic boat shape. Make sure to keep the smooth part of the wire on the bottom side and really have any little knots on the sticks cut off. Good multi-tool really comes in handy. So I'm just putting a bunch of little cuts in this and this will help this flex. And that's gonna kind of form the shape of the bottom of our canoe. There we go, ready for some wire. Sliding in another rib here, perfect. So I think it's coming along nicely. The next step is we're gonna put in two long saplings just underneath the gunnel on either side. And those are gonna be the chine rods Okay, so we have the basic shape of the boat finished, but now we have to lie bows and small sticks along the bottom, which is gonna act as a floor, and then the last step is gonna be to wrap the tarp around it. Lie down the tarp in a softer area where there's some grass and some mud, and then basically wrap the tarp around the canoe. So there we go. Our tarp canoe is finished. Now we're ready to give it a whirl. Here we go. All right, it's working. Steering pretty good. Trying to get over to this eddy here. One of the things that's important when you're paddling, correction strokes. The J stroke, your top hand bends over like this. 
using the power face of your paddle to spin to the outside and then push against the water. Then you have the Canadian where you actually do a J stroke but then slice it back through the water before your next stroke starts. The Indian stroke, it's a great silent stroke, it's also good in wind. It's where you spin the paddle 360 degrees in your hand and you keep the blade in the water the entire time. You can steer uh, throughout the entire stroke. The stern pry, I use it sometime after I've J-stroked quite a bit and I just want a quick change or in rapids, the stern pry is the one to use right here. You can always pry off the gunnel too. Pretty much any of the strokes you can use the gunnel to pry off of to strengthen it or rest your hand on. A key river paddling skill, it's the eddy out. What an eddy is, it's where you see the water eddying back up river at the side of a rapid or at the side of a river where there's a strong current. A nice safe place to bail or get out of the canoe. To get into an eddy, aim the bow of your canoe into the top of that eddy. The back current will start spinning your boat and then you want to reach out forward with your paddle, stick it into the eddy and draw the water in towards your bow. That will help you spin 180. On your offhand side, do a cross draw and spin that paddle over to the other side, plunge it into the eddy and draw in towards the bow and you might want to follow up with a cross forward stroke or switch over and paddle on the other side just to make sure you keep yourself in there. You're always going to want to lean to the up river side of the canoe and that will make sure that you don't tip. That's a great way to stay safe when you're paddling rivers. You can get over mid rapid, you can get over before a waterfall and a lot of time the eddies are where the fish are as well. So keep that in mind and uh, practice your eddy turns. One of the things that makes the canoe probably the most versatile outdoor vessel is its portability. Even a couple hundred yards of carrying your canoe can put you into a lake that is well away from the crowd. Hoisting a canoe up into your shoulders looks tough, but let me tell you this, it's not about brute strength, it's more about technique. So I'm gonna show you a couple steps to get a canoe up onto your shoulders. You're gonna tilt the boat up like this on its side. Hands on the gunnel on either side of the carrying yoke. Lift the canoe up onto your thighs. Then I'm gonna throw the canoe up and grab it like that in the middle of the carrying yoke. And now I'm gonna push up again and I'm gonna grab the opposite side. Now the hand that was in the middle of the carrying yoke is gonna go back here. And now with one swing, I'm gonna push up with my abdomen and I'm gonna basically spring the canoe up and get under it like this. And with that technique, you're gonna be able to get your canoe onto your shoulders using skill as opposed to brute force, save your back, and get to those backcountry lakes and get on some fish. Here I am on a big lake, beautiful evening, and I'm paddling into a bit of a headwind. Paddling into a headwind can be challenging because usually where you sit in the canoe will trim the boat stern heavy, and that'll leave the front out of the water like that, and the wind will want to blow you and point your bow backwards. And you can see what happens right here. So you waste a lot of energy trying to fight the wind, and if the wind's any stronger than this, it just gets impossible. So I'm gonna just move up here, and I'm gonna sit or kneel on the middle thwart, and now I have the canoe trimmed, bow heavy. See how the wind doesn't spin me and weather vane me? Now the wind is actually working with me and it's automatically pointing me straight into the wind. And at the end of the day, I'll put a lot more miles behind me because I haven't wasted all my energy trying to straighten out. By the same principles, when you're faced with a tailwind, you're gonna to wanna to trim your boat stern heavy and that'll keep you pointed straight and you're gonna make some good time because paddling with a tailwind is pretty much a paddler's dream.